Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and Good thank afternoon. you for tuning in to today's review. I'm Valentine Haminwa of Haminwa Advocates, and today I will be speaking with Nelson Harvey and Carolyn Dowdy Kamende, who serve as President and Vice President of the Law Society of Kenya, respectively. Today marks a hundred days since Nelson Harvey took over leadership of the Law Society under the clarion call of a brave new bar. He ran his campaign under a three-point agenda to monitor legislation, to protect practice and the practice environment, to defend the rule of law. We will critically review and assess his accomplishments and those of LSK under these three broad endeavors so far. A greater part of the interview will comprise of questions which have already been sent in by members of LSK as well as members of the broader civil society, critics and commentators, all weighing in on the accomplishments, challenges and priorities of the leadership of the Brave New Bar in his role as president of the Law Society. We will also give advocates who are present with us an opportunity to ask our speakers a few questions. And with this, uh, to President Harvey and Madam VP, thank you and welcome to today's review. Thank you. Okay. So, um, Harvey, when you ran for office, you promised members to focus on monitoring legislation, protecting law practice environment, and defending the rule of law and constitutionalism. Uh, so far, you've racked up quite a list of accomplishments, and some people are even calling you the Messiah. Now, before we get into analyzing your track record, can you please give us an overview of what is the LSK? Um, a lot of members of civil society and some members within law, the society itself aren't sure exactly what is the mandate and the role of the society, please. Thank you so much, uh, Valentine. First and foremost, may I sincerely apologize to my learned colleagues as well as members of the public. This event was supposed to start at exactly 1.30. However, and uh, most gratefully, my, my 100 days in office coincided with the launch of the e-filing system. The Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya, David uh, Kenani Maraga, had invited me witness uh, the launch of this noble project, which ties up with uh, my agenda to expand the practice uh, environment for lawyers. With that, may I therefore address uh, the key concern that has been raised by Madam Haminwa. Now, the Law Society is uh, an entity that is created under the Law Society of Kenya Act 2014. The Law Society is a statutory body it's a, a body whose membership is mandatory for all practicing advocates in Kenya. It has a raft of functions set out uh, under the Act, being 14 functions and objectives in, in total. But fundamental amongst uh, the 14 functions and objectives are uh, uh, the following. One is to assist the government of the Republic of Kenya together with the courts of law in the administration of justice. Two, to assist the government of the Republic of Kenya in oversighting legislation. And three, to improve the general access to justice, not only by advocates, but, the, but, but also by the entire members of the Kenyan public. And it must be understood that the Law Society of Kenya has played a fundamental role insofar as all those 14 functions and objectives are concerned and in particular, those three. And it is on the basis of that that when I ran for office, I said, I may not exhaust all the 14 objectives and functions within a short period of uh, two years. But if I lay a good foundation on the basis of the three main pillars upon which I ran, then the generation that will take after me and many years to come will be able to build upon the foundation that I've left in order that we have a law society that does not benefit only its members, but also the members of the public. Because in times of this kind, where we experience lack of hope and direction, where there appear to be no proper guidance from the legislature, where the executive 
is hell bent on domineering over the other two arms of government, where the judiciary, despite all efforts towards ensuring that you have access to justice, appears weakened because of one reason or another, the law society stands out as the source of hope, as the beacon of direction, direction not just lawyers, but to the entire Kenyan fraternity. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, related to that, um, as regards the three-point agenda, which is part of the LSK statute that you've mentioned, um, what have you done in your first 100 days as regards monitoring legislation and legislative audit? What has the Law Society done so far? Now, we took over office in... Uh, circumstances that I must say were unprecedented. That was on the 24th of March 2020. It had been the expectation of the members of the Law Society that will take over office as has been the tradition for a long period of time at the annual general meeting of the Society that was scheduled for the 30th of March 2020. But as you are all aware, the outbreak of this pandemic interfered with all normal operations of uh, all governmental functions and the functions of private entities and the law society uh, suffered a similar fate. As a result, the AGM was postponed indefinitely and uh, in the light of that lacuna, my council and myself made a decision that we will assume office in the manner in which we assumed. And this pandemic came with so many challenges, one of which was enumerated in the speech by the President of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, the need to alleviate the pain of Kenyans by reducing the burden of tax on them. There was a, a bill that was published uh, for consideration by the National Assembly. The Law Society of Kenya, through the Tax Committee, played a fundamental role in ensuring that the, 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 the law that came out eventually takes into account the specific needs of lawyers, the specific needs of needy Kenyans, so that they are able to survive within the period of the pandemic and for a longer period of time immediately thereafter. That's number one. Number two, the Ministry of Health came up with guidelines and regulations to enable the Republic of Kenya to contain this pandemic. And uh, I must say at the onset that it is not our desire as the Law Society of Kenya to interfere with the legislative processes of, uh, of, of Parliament. But it's incumbent upon us, and indeed it is a duty given to us by uh, Article 118 and 119 of the Constitution, as well as Section 4 of the Law Society of Kenya Act, to ensure that we participate fully in order that the laws that come out of Parliament are beneficial to the Mwananchi in Kenya. Now you remember the regulations that were put in place insofar as uh, the curfew was concerned and the manner in which the police came out to enforce it. We tackled it in two aspects. First, we went to court to challenge uh, those regulations and two, we petitioned Parliament to take into account the needs of the Kenyan people even as the government takes the noble role of ensuring that we are protected from this pandemic. Now, two decisions were made. One was on the, on the 16th of April, 2020, in which the court recognized the need for the police to ensure that they don't use reasonable force in the enforcement of the curfew order. And then this issue eventually came to parliament and the discussion that uh, the parliamentarians had to uh, engage in was how best to ensure that the interests of the Kenyans, insofar as the law society has indicated the areas of concern, will be met. The subsequent decision was made uh, uh, a week ago in which the court said that some of these regulations that were being enforced during the curfew and the pandemic period had not been subjected to a participatory approach, they had not been subjected to the legislative uh, aspect of it in, in, in the National Assembly. And to that extent, it is uh, a vindication on our part that uh, we have stood out most prominently to ensure that the laws that pass through Parliament are those 
that meet the threshold set under the Constitution and are those that are beneficial to the people of Kenya. There are many other uh, bills that have been published which uh, our Law Reform Committee is constantly reviewing to ensure that the interests of the general uh, Kenyan public are taken into account and more importantly the interests of lawyers are taken into account. And remember, as I said much earlier during my campaign, I do not want the law society to be in court day after day only litigating on the legality or otherwise of laws when we have an opportunity of presenting our views in parliament in order that they are incorporated so that we litigate over disputes that arise out of a law instead of litigating over the validity of that law. So insofar as uh, legislation is concerned, I think we have set a very good foundation okay. upon which we'll be able to ensure that in the coming few months of our tenure in office, we, we, we'll have a parliament that creates laws that uh, will be there for longevity. Okay, okay. So thank you. Um, going to the second prong of your goals, um, in terms of protecting the practice environment for advocates and the public in general. Um, just last week we saw here at Gitanga Road, you commemorated the untimely death of our colleague Willie Kimani. Um, no sooner had this commemoration occurred, earlier this week we saw advocates being assaulted and abused as they tried to enter the Kitui County Assembly. Um, what are you doing and what have you done to protect the practice environment and the interests of lawyers in the profession so far? Now, because uh, that department falls squarely within uh, the hands of my able vice president, I'll give her an opportunity to weigh in a little bit and then uh, I will compliment on what she will have said. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um,
getting provision for the thing. The unfortunate incident that uh, happened in this week, I will confirm to members that um, I have told the president and uh, members of council taken the initiative to get involved in the investigation and issued a press release uh, and then the act. But other than that, I am in touch uh, with the colleagues who are affected. That aspect of uh, members' welfare and uh, section four, I am on top of it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's very good. And related to that, more specifically regarding the Young Bar Association, um, they have expressed um, views that their interests are not being quite championed as regards um, exploitation in the workplace, low remuneration harassment, verbal abuse, um, what are you doing to assist advocates within, within the profession, advocates relating to each other in terms of our welfare? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now uh, back to Javi. Um, regarding the third section of the three points of your agenda, what are you doing to defend the rule of law and constitutionalism in Kenya? Court orders are not being obeyed. Um, we are replete with examples, um, not least to mention Miguna Miguna. What are you doing as president of the Law Society regarding this, this agenda item? Thank you, Valentine. Uh, may, may I acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, my able council member, representative for Nairobi, uh, Caroline Mudeu, who also chairs uh, the Alternative Dispute uh, uh, Resolution Committee. We were with her uh, at the Supreme Court uh, building in the morning, and she deemed it fit uh, to join us. Uh, welcome, uh, Madam Mudeu. Now, uh, rule of law and constitutionalism. This is uh, one pillar of uh, my campaign which resonates well, not only with lawyers, but the entire Kenyan public. Because it is the Kenyan public that benefits when the wheels of justice move 
effortlessly. This morning, uh, see as uh, Adon Mohammed uh, indicated uh, to us when we were launching the e-registry, that the concern that he faces every day when he meets investors is this. What will happen to me as a businessman or a businesswoman when I step on the toes of big people in Kenya? Will I be protected? What will happen to me if I have a commercial dispute which I submit to the courts of law in Kenya? Will I get a just and fair determination? And these questions are quite germane and they resonate very well with the point that uh, you just raised. Because if the rule of law and constitutionalism is not respected, then the entire fabric that ties up, that ties together a civilized society will, will break and will not have any progression. Now back to this point, substantively, the questions that we have had to deal with uh, at the onset are this. One is the issue of the appointment of the 41 judges that were recommended for appointment by the Judicial Service Commission. When we took office, we deliberated over this issue. I can tell the members for a fact that before we took the action in respect of which a case has already been filed by the Attorney General and the Solicitor General, I attempted to pursue a diplomatic uh, way of getting reprieve out of this matter. I called the Attorney General I called the Solicitor General and we spoke at length and they indicated that it will be more productive if we are to meet up to resolve this issue. Eventually a meeting was held on the 13th of May. Unfortunately, the Attorney General and the Solicitor General stopped this meeting and sent their representatives who indicated to us that they didn't have any capacity whatsoever to deliberate or bind on this matter. Nonetheless, we wrote back to the Attorney General on the 13th of May and told him, look, indicate to us how best you want this matter resolved. And if you don't want the matter resolved, then we'll be forced to take action against you. That is why on the 12th of June 2020, the Council of the Law Society drafted and served upon the Attorney General and Solicitor General a motion for the expulsion. And the power to expel a member of the law society is given under Section 13 of the Act. So it's a power that is exercisable. You are aware that the two individuals moved to court. And uh, surprisingly, the judiciary, which we want to protect through this action, gave them a court order uh, stopping deliberations in this motion and giving a date outside the date uh, schedule for the, uh, for, 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 for the AGM. But that notwithstanding, it is my commitment to ensure that the 41 judges are sworn in because we need judges to sit to hear and determine cases. Still on the rule of law and constitutionalism, we have spoken very boldly and firmly, and I dare say swiftly, when uh, the executive makes appointments that do not accord with the law, and in particular the constitution. You saw when uh, Retired Justice Erastus Gijinji was appointed a chair of the Tax Appeals Tribunal. We wrote a demand letter and indicated to the Cabinet Secretary in charge of that uh, issue that what he had done was unlawful. Uh, as uh, you are aware, the Cabinet Secretary retreated, withdrew that appointment, and made an appointment which was acceptable to the entire membership. Because uh, our friend Nyongesa is somebody who is well known to you, is capacities and accomplishments in the area of tax law well known. Now we have a chair of the Tax Appeal Tribunal who is conversant and who is able to deal with issues that relate not only to the lawyers but also to the public. Number three, when the President of the Republic of Kenya issued an executive order the result of which was to bring the Judiciary, the Judicial Service Commission, and all other independent commissions within his control as executive, the Law Society made a demand to the Attorney General and told him, look, what the President has done is wrong. Could you please advise the President to relook the matter and see how best to resolve this matter? And uh, it has been the practice of the Attorney General, he ignored our advice. As we speak right now, there is in court litigation to challenge that action. Number four, 
I indicated to the members of the public and uh, my fellow colleagues that we will compile all court orders that have been disobeyed, in particular by the state, state agencies and state officers. We now have a register of these court orders and it will surprise you that uh, as we continue collecting this information, we so far have about 200 orders that have been disobeyed. Amongst these orders, a decrease for the payment of money, which totaled to about 300 billion. The government of the Republic of Kenya has refused to own a decrease. 300 million is such a colossal sum of money, which if available to the public, will have helped improve the general economy and development. There are other areas in which we are liaising with, the, with, with partners, both state and non-state actors, to ensure that the rule of law and constitutionalism prevails in Kenya. And it is my expectation and it is my, my request to all of you, Kenyans, of whatever uh, cadre, professionals of whatever uh, nature, to come together and ensure that there is vigilance. If appointments are being made in a particular uh, statutory body, do they accord with the Constitution? Are they, in, are, are, are they in tandem with the law? Is there public participation? Is there regional and ethnic balance? Uh, do the appointments meet the, the, the professional or academic qualifications? These are issues that need to be interrogated so that we empower individuals who have the capacity, the wherewithal, the determination to serve, not to reward uh, uh, people just because they are affiliated with you, because there is need to weed out chronism, ethnicity in these uh, appointments. And uh, last amongst uh, this, this category of issues is the appointment uh, insofar as uh, the sector of the Teacher Service Commission is okay. concerned. Uh, two days ago, I wrote a letter to the Attorney General indicating to the Attorney General that the, that the term of the holder of that office has come to an end. And under the law, the holder of that office must be recruited competitively. There are many other areas of oversight, including uh, Nairobi Metropolitan Services, where we are asked to appoint one of our members as a member of the physical planning uh, committee who will have eventually be a chair. We wrote back and told the uh, uh, Major General Buddy that we do not recognize that entity called Nairobi Metropolitan Services. Of course, there was a lot of backlash, including from members of the public and members of the society. And as day succeeds night, that matter was taken before the court and we were vindicated. And we'll continue doing this because it is our desire to improve the quality of governance in this country. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, your response has focused on um, the efforts that you're making at a legal, lef uh, legal level. Um, they've also focused on violations by state actors. Can you tell me a bit more about what you and the Law Society are doing in terms of, I don't want to say ordinary disputes, but the common dispute that a person might have with their neighbor and they owed a decree of, let's say, 50,000 shillings what, what are you doing in order to enforce the rule of law in terms of civic education, legal literacy programs, um, assisting the average Kenyan who has a legal dispute to enforce their court orders, where it doesn't necessarily concern the, the state or you know, large sums of money or big issues of constitutional dispute? Thank you, Valentine. Uh, the, the, the rule of law is beneficial irrespective of who the respondent or who is required to honor a court order or a decree is. And it's very fundamental, therefore, that members of the public recognize that if you submit
So um, in your manifesto, you made a pledge and I'm going to quote exactly what you said. You said, I will not affiliate myself with any political party or with the state. Um, are the claims of Alice Gay's neu neutrality on political issues truly defensible? Um, there's some perception that you're a Nazarite. Um, other people think you're aligned to Jubilee, a certain faction within Jubilee. There's some people who've even said that you have a sponsor and that you're a puppet of certain political interests. Um, what, what do you have to say about that? Oh, I, I believe, uh, Valentine, you are referring to the undertaking that uh, I, I made. And the undertaking yes. uh, went as follows that I will serve the society diligently and gallantly with integrity and accountability. I will not affiliate myself with any political party or the state. I will not take any state appointment, recommendation or award. Let me pause there for a minute. Now, there are those who in the recent past have categorized me as uh, one affiliated uh, to, to the Vice President, uh, Dr. William uh, uh, Ruto, as a, as a tanga tanga. Let me make this quite clear. Uh, Dr. William Ruto is somebody I've known for a long period of time. And uh, in the event that his camp appears to have been isolated with the result that they resonate with the ideals that I've held as a revolutionist, why should I be blamed? Because they may be the default beneficiary of what we are saying and what we are speaking about. But, wholesomely, I have ensured that I abide by the vow that I took. But let's look at this issue more objectively, because we'll be told the law society is supposed not to engage in politics. What is politics? There is, there is a study called political science. And if you interrogate political science more thoroughly, you will find that 80% of political science is law and the rest is, is, is social affairs. Because what is the framework under which the government of Kenya is run? Is it not run under the constitution? It's run on the basis of statutes. And when those in power do not want to govern the country in accordance with the constitution, in accordance with the statute, we must call them out be it the president of the Republic of Kenya, be it the vice president, be it the leader of the opposition, or anybody. And that is our responsibility. And Nelson Harvey is not the first servant of the law society to do this. What I'm doing is not, no, it's not, it's not novel. It's been done before. Dr. Gibson Kamau Kuria was uh, the chairman of this organization at a point in time when we had the clamor for multi-party democracy. What about Dr. William Mutunga? What about Honorable Paul Mwite? You remember at one point in time, a member of the Law Society took the counsel of uh, Honorable Paul Mwite to court, indicating that they need not comment about matters of politics. And why is there this push society from issues of great concern? It's because they know lawyers are better placed to advise, shape opinion in the manner in which good governance should be done, and they do not want the participation of lawyers at this particular point in time, because there is need to push a constitutional amendment. And if the public is not informed of what is necessary in this particular instance, then the public is likely to be railroaded through a path in which the constitutional amendments will be forced upon them. And I say this with a lot of conviction, because these are not my views. I remember last year at the annual conference that was held in August in Mombasa, lawyers resolved unanimously that the question, the problem that bedevils administration in Kenya is not inadequacy of the law, it's inadequacy of good leadership. It's an issue of implementation, it's not an issue of reform. So that when we are told that we have a moment, what is this moment? I agree there is a moment, but it's not a moment for constitutional change. And let me echo the words of Honorable Martha Karua. It is a moment for change. Change of what? Change of leadership. Because the problem is not in the seeds. 
The problem is in the seat holder. You cannot replace the seat. You replace the individual. And lawyers must always speak as far as this issue is concerned. And I'll give you many examples. Sorry, let me just give you a few examples. Fidel Castro was a lawyer. Nelson Mandela was a lawyer. Barack Obama is a lawyer. So if you don't want lawyers to participate fully in the leadership of this country, you are turning logic over its head because the responsibility of leadership, I dare say, is one that is participatory. And there is no way in which lawyers should be excluded from this serious enterprise. In particular, at this point in time, when there is need for us to relook the structure and the means of governance in this country. So related to the issue of special interest and um, financing, um, Caroline, can you just explain to me how is the Law Society of Kenya funded? Body, do you receive funding from um, taxes and the exchequer? Of, uh, staff and finance okay. and uh, the law society is a statutory body uh, where members pay subscriptions so the law society depends on funds from our own members when they pay for practicing certificates okay. the law society also part of uh, our functions under um, section 4 of uh, uh, act number 21 of 2014 mm -hmm is to we can invest and raise uh, funds the law society uh, through the cpds also uh, finances its own uh, activities we collect funds from members when they attend uh, uh, cpds and uh, um, currently we, we we are also getting funds from the webinar that we are hosting uh, we also fundraise during the annual conference okay. from uh, well wishers and uh, once in a while we get partnership, like we have uh, a partnership with uh, uh, a body called SAD, okay. in these containers behind here. Okay. So we, as the law society, do not get any funds from the government. We regulate our own finances. We get monies from our members and they uh, use the monies in and for our members. Okay. So, so we do no not... Special. There's no special, we are not in the uh, government's uh, budget. Yes, Excellent. thank you. Okay, good. Um, that's good to know. Um, so on the structure of the law society, um, I'd like to discuss the council of the law society. Um, there are eight members in the council, um, of which you will both two or the eight. The other six seats comprise of four, which are specifically for our country representatives. Now, the way the current voting structure is requires a majority vote from every advocate in the country. The majority of advocates are housed in Nairobi and Mombasa. So there have been views from members of the society that it's improper for the deciding factor to come from Nairobi as to who's going so for instance, with those six remaining seats in the council, four have been taken up by upcountry representatives, majority of whom were voted in by Nairobi members. Um, so you find one of the, and, and there are eight regional upcountry branches. So for example, Mount Kenya branch has been completely excluded from this law society. Is there a way that the voting structure could be changed so that upcountry representative votes are conducted at a branch level as opposed to being decided by Nairobi and Mombasa with the majority of lawyers in the city. You want to talk it up, Madam Vipi? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I remember during the So to the extent that every uh, member of the 
party is represented at the branch level, that's uh, when they start to Okay. Uh, well, I must also uh, agree and admit that the majority of the votes come from Nairobi. I think we have almost 70 percent or so uh, mm -hmm. members who vote from Nairobi, and, they, and to a large extent, they determine the sub country representatives. Uh, um, unless first we change the act, then that has to stay. But my view is uh, because we already have uh, officials at the branch level, we still have representatives. We still need the council still needs representatives from the okay. uh, regardless of where they're going from. So. taking uh, uh, firm decisions on funding and any other so we still need them at the national level otherwise if we leave this uh, council we leave the council to have representation from Nairobi then uh, we will not get feedback from the branches um, section uh, the, the, the section I think 27 that uh, creates the branches uh, also creates uh, 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 an, an, let me say, uh, a function of the national office uh, in a science branch, branches are concerned. It gives the branches the function of taking care of welfare and practice matters, but it also tells the branches, come to the national office and uh, raise the matters that you need uh, addressed from the national office. Okay. So, uh, That is how the national office uh, rolls out some of these uh, mandates, the PIM process branches. So okay. My feeling is uh, there's adequate representation. Good to know. I don't know what uh, the Yeah, let me let me weigh in uh, on the issue. See, the, the most unfortunate thing about democracy is that its, its certainty is often limited to numbers, quantity. It doesn't really give a good outcome in so far as quality is concerned. No wonder, therefore, when uh, when 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 I took my council to the All Saints Cathedral for blessings. People were shocked. Why is it that you have uh, 10 women with you and you're just two men? How did this happen? And then I, I told them, but you guys said you wanted women in the leadership of the law society. Why are you complaining? Mm -hmm. And then look at it from the other side. We have a, a vice president and the president of the law society who have also come from Nairobi. These are the outcomes of democracy. But we must always realize that there are times that you may need affirmative action to complement the, 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 the unpredictable outcomes of democracy. Yeah. Because if you look at the structure of the Law Society of Kenya, it has created the eight branches. It has also created the council members. It has created the office of the vice president and uh, the president. But the roles are not clearly delineated. So that uh, most of our work ends up being done through committees. And... Uh, the, the, the president often will need to set the agenda of how the council will function. There is this school of thought. The election of the vice president and the president alone. And we, read, we let uh, the other representatives be elected by the branches. There are the pros and uh, the cons for, 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 for such a, an, an option. And I'm aware that... Uh, there is a motion that uh, has been made by a member to have the act amended in order that elections are conducted in the manner in which I've just enumerated uh, here in above. That we have the president, the vice president, and then the rest of the council members are elected by the branches. Look, if that is the view of members, then... As I've said, 
these are the outcomes of democracy. But if the members are of the view that we need to go that route, then make that decision through the AGM. On our part, and as indicated uh, in my manifesto, I will champion uh, legislation. And if the members want legislation to the effect that we have elections conducted in this pattern, I'll be the first one to support it. If members don't want it, I'll be the first one to support it. Thank you. And um, do you feel you're receiving adequate support from your council as is? Just in terms of your day-to-day -day uh, the most, Yeah, the most unfortunate thing about uh, running for council is that uh, we don't have uh, parties, neither do we have independent candidates. So you will find uh, council members who are otherwise affiliated to other presidential candidates still suffer from uh, the slumber of campaigns and we want to bring the ideologies within the operations of the council. Uh, this, this is quite unfortunate. All the presidential candidates affiliated themselves with the outcome of this election. So I, I'll, I'll be frank with you, uh, and I don't blame the council members, because perhaps it's the failure of early realization that we are out of the campaign period and we now have a duty. Because uh, truth be told, uh, I, I know many council members who did not affiliate themselves with me, but I don't have a problem with them. We have a duty to perform within this. Mm -hmm. If uh, uh, myself and uh, uh, the Ambo there are not friends, but we find ourselves at sea and is holding the other end of the log and I'm holding the other end of the log, we we'll maintain the balance so that we go, we, we go ashore. Yeah. But if we start fighting uh, at sea, we will sink. And this is the message that I want to give uh, the council members. And let them also realize that, uh, as said by Sir Charles Kanjama, Harvey is one gentleman who did not even know how to ride a tuk-tuk. But if you're not careful, he'll end up uh, flying the plane <laughs> that is called the presidency of the law society. And it came to pass. Why? Because there was a lot of bickering amongst many of the candidates who were previously in council. So I want to encourage my council members that there is need for us to work together. Uh, Steve Ogola describes me very well, that Harvey is swift and firm. And often this, uh, this, this character trait is uh, misconstrued as belligerent and, and arrogant. And I think there could be no better evaluation of Nelson Harvey than that given by uh, Steve Ogola. Because I have this need for urgency. And this need is not peculiar to me. Mm -hmm. Many will say that uh, Harvey is coming very fast. What do you mean Harvey is coming very fast? Do you know at what age uh, David Cameron became Prime Minister of England? He was Prime Minister of England at the, at the age of 43. And before him, in 18... Uh, Lord Liverpool became my Prime Minister at the age of 22. Herod the Great, by the time he died at the age of 36, had built three cities in Israel, uh, Masada, uh, uh, Caesarea, and uh, Herodea. At the age of 36, here I am, 44, and you're telling me that I'm going too fast for my age. Let's not turn logic over its head. We don't have the luxury of time, and as I've told you, within the next remaining few months of our tenure here. We need to do things. We need to develop LSK Plaza here. We need to leave a legacy where if Mudeo becomes vice president, where if Linus Mwangi becomes president, where if Aska Kwamboka or Kari becomes president, they'll be able to say, look, like uh, the, 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 the temple in Jerusalem, they'll say, these are the stones that were laid by Harvey, and I want to build on them to give us a good legacy so that we, we, we thrive and prosper, not individually, but collectively. Okay. So related to that, in terms of your efficiency and your leadership style, um, you've certainly accomplished a lot in a short space of time. People are calling you the Messiah. However, other people perceive you as having a dictatorial leadership style. Um, they say that you weren't that way in the campaign, but now that you're in office, you've become a bit of a dictator. Um, with specific reference, there was a video which was circulating on social media 
in which you had a heated exchange with one of the members of your council. Um, what, what do you have to say about that? Um, she, it was regarding, um, I think, the ratification of a motion to take action against the Solicitor General and the Attorney General. Um, that's, that's what the, vi the video was about. You had a meeting with your council and... Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody posted on Twitter that Harvey has become a small dictator. I, no wonder, therefore, they share a birthday with Adolf Hitler. <laughs> Very unfortunate statements. But uh, the truth of the matter is this. Insofar as that instance is concerned, these are the facts. Mm -hmm. The council unanimously resolved on the 11th of May 2020 that they will take two actions. One was to commence proceedings for the expulsion of uh, the Attorney General and the Solicitor General. And two, that they will also petition Parliament to impeach the President of the Republic of Kenya. Those were not my ideas. Those were the ideas of the council, unanimous. Now, when it came to the drafting and signing of the motion on the 12th of June 2020, one member just decided not to participate in the process. And if you are to interrogate that video more thoroughly, okay. you realize that uh, there was a lot of interruption from that member, okay. not only against me, but against any other speaker who spoke. Okay. Uh, your question is this, that Harvey has become a dictator, yet he was not a dictator before. I think if I'm a dictator, then I was a dictator before. And the membership was quite cognizant of this fact. But th there's no credibility in that claim that Harvey is a dictator. Mm. Let me quote what uh, Canon Ambrose Weda said in uh, a webinar organized uh, by the TIBA. What, Manuel, what did the, um, Ambrose Weda say? Did he not say that there are people who grow by force? Yeah. Okay. And uh, look, if I have the ability to run faster than you, you can't tell me to wait for you. Perhaps you just need to improve on your speed. Maybe this is what is always erroneously perceived as he uh, heavy handedness. Okay. But perhaps more progressively, there is need for lawyers, not just members of the law society, but also the leadership, to acquaint themselves with the law. Because you are seated here as council members with the responsibility of providing guidance. Do not leave it upon me to read the law for you. Because I'll become a little bit impatient mm -hmm. if you do not understand the obvious. For instance, mm -hmm. the case of Professor Martha, Professor Wangari Matai, the Attorney General, on the issue as to whether you can exercise a constitutional right or a statutory right in the absence of rules. And if I become impatient on account of your failure of understanding, I really do not think that I'm the person to blame. It is you to blame. Go and read the law. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, so, Caroline, I just wanted to go back um, to the question of funding and um, finances at um, the Law Society. You mentioned that most of the revenue comes from our annual dues um, and some fundraising at the AGM. Most of the profession have been affected by COVID-19. Um, I don't know anyone who's really thriving right now, um, not even Microsoft. So, um, how, how, what is the fiscal health of the Law Society right now? What is our financial status? I think you circulated reports. Can you just give us a synopsis of how things stand financially for the Society right now? Society are not uh, financially crippled. Uh, we, will, uh, we, we will evaluate that probably at the end of this, at the end of this month. But uh, the society is still uh, safe financially. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I'm still staying on COVID. Um, we, w one of the big accomplishments is the classification of lawyers as essential service providers. Will this categorization last even beyond COVID, that we'll have certain exceptions, um, I don't know, regarding certain permissions? And, and why did you feel it was necessary for lawyers to be classified within that category? Okay. Uh, first and foremost, I want to dissuade most of our members uh, of this notion that the essential service provider card is a license for you to go party and drinking and go back home late. Look, if you are arrested by the policeman at night and you are drunk, do not uh, flash your essential service provider card. Neither do you call me. Don't even call the VP. Because this card is intended to enable you perform your duties as an advocate within and outside the curfew limitation times to move from one place to another. We, we need not abuse this, uh, this, this card. And uh, it must be understood as lawyers, it is our obligation to lead insofar as complying with the law is concerned. We may have a lot of dissatisfaction with the manner in which the government declared the curfew the manner in which the government uh, declared the restriction of movement. But I'll tell you, on my part, I'm the first person to obey those laws. Because laws are valid until otherwise declared invalid by a court of law. So I encourage members of the law society to comply with the law, even when you enjoy the essential service provider card. For how long will it last? It's supposed to last for a limited period of time okay. until when the government declares that there is no longer curfew, there is no longer restriction of movement. But way forward, and I've had this discussion with the Director of Public Prosecution as well as the Inspector General of Police, we need to have a conducive environment where lawyers will practice and where their practice will be respected, where you will be facilitated. We want, going forward, to ensure that when lawyers are engaged in perennial assignments, they're given police protection. And uh, this protection is not limited to lawyers. I also want this protection to extend to other professionals. I want this protection to extend to members of the public. And when we commemorated uh, four years of the killing of uh, Willie Kimani and uh, his client and taxi driver, we reached this amistice with the director of public prosecution that we will petition parliament to undertake law reform with the result that we'll have policemen restricted in the manner in which they can engage with the public especially when they're conducting an arrest or an operation we want policemen to be identified with their uniform rank number we don't want policemen roaming around in Subaru that are unmarked, policemen roaming around in plain clothes. How can we identify them and differentiate them from criminals? You understand? That, 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 that's perilous. So that the only category of policemen who can be in civilian court are those entrusted with the responsibility of gathering intelligence. But if you're coming to my home to arrest me and you are in a jeans and a jacket, I have no reason whatsoever to open the door for you because you may as well be a criminal, you understand? So that uh, in particular, insofar as it relates to lawyers, we want the practice environment to expand. When you go to a police station, you must be given preferential treatment. You will not be told that we are interrogating your client, so stay out. And these are colonial relics. And the Inspector General of Police, as well as uh, the, the DPP, must understand that we are living in an, in an age where rights given to Kenyans must be respected. And who is the defender of rights other than lawyers? Why will you, as a Kenyan, want to be interrogated by the police in the absence of your advocate? So we want to improve the manner in which the relationship between advocates and police progresses.
bit of them have speech, how to finish, and uh, we never have uh, spoken to the OPS of a particular police station, uh, they have got out. So we had <laughs> the members who have been arrested and uh, taken to the police station, but uh, uh, have been very cooperative, mm -hmm. especially where we have explained that uh, uh, the lawyers, especially when they established that the lawyers are not uh, coming from clubs and yeah, yeah. coming from work, and I must uh, give credit to the Giri police station. Uh, last on Friday, uh, uh, one of our colleagues reached out to me and told me that uh, she was sitting there uh, recording a statement and she's past nine. I called the DCIO of that uh, station and uh, he assured me that uh, they, they will drive her to her home because she had left her car in town and she got oh, help. So on this uh, emergency uh, services card, mm -hmm. uh, we haven't really had uh, many challenges because uh, the authorities have operated and they have listened to, to us. Uh, and I, I think I, I received 99% of these calls and uh, I haven't had a member send the uh, at a police station when I had reached out to the OPS or the so it's good to know that the permission is not being abused and people yes. are actually working, working over time. Um, please, can you give me your views on rogue practitioners and quacks and people masquerading as lawyers? It's something that's happening often. A lot of times it's by pupils who are anxious to start work, maybe make a little money. However, it's cheapening and embarrassing administration doing about masquerading in the profession. Okay, I take it or you'll take it? I take it. Take it. Yeah. We have a uh, okay. uh, committee that uh, uh, the CEO uh, follows up the uh, staff. Okay. But uh, during the campaign, uh, what I saw uh, Many of our members uh, just establish offices all over and leave their clerks and assistants uh, who are not advocates to handle. Yeah. That is a cause uh, of concern. Okay. That is where we should act uh, as a law society. So the, uh, all these work uh, are people who, uh, are le uh, who work with our staff. They use our staff, they use our yeah. offices, and uh, that responsibility should of, of, of cabin. launching today the e-filing may be also uh, one of the ways that we will curb this uh, vice because they would require you to put in a P105 number. I think we made that proposal that uh, they, uh, I need to see my P105 number. And uh, we, uh, this virtual hearing will also be the end of court. Yes. The, I mean, when I'm in the waiting room, they can tell that this is an advocate or this is not an advocate. So that may help, but we are still working on, on that. I know our CEO is very passionate about the uh, quack, but we, we need the support of the judiciary and uh, our members. Yes. Because every town, uh, and, and especially also the branch there, they know each other. So they know this one is a quack, this one is not a quack. Yeah, yeah. We know each other. So it, it is us. Uh, to call them out. Okay. Yes. Okay. Then can, uh, pick it up Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
Tomorrow we'll be attending the admission uh, of uh, a number of advocates. Thereafter, on Thursday, when is tomorrow? Tomorrow is Thursday. Yes. Yeah, so tomorrow is the first batch of admission. The second batch is on Friday. Uh, we've designed an online system in which uh, effective tomorrow will cut paperwork at the Secretariat of the Law Society. Uh, the application for a PC will henceforth be fully digital. There will be no paperwork. And then we have uh, coordinated with the judiciary. We've also coordinated with the Ministry of Lands. And we want to coordinate with all other departments that uh, uh, interrelate with the delivery of, of justice, including the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, uh, KIPI, uh, other, uh, other tribunals, to ensure that they have a digital register of advocates who have practicing certificates. And uh, the word quirk and unqualified persons is not just limited to those individuals who have not studied law. It's, it, it, it encompasses us who have not taken practicing certificates. So that when I tackle you on Twitter and ask you, have you taken a practicing certificate? You are a quirk. You are an unqualified person. You have no business engaging with us. Because as learned friends, we need to protect the dignity and honor of this profession. Because if we don't do that, we will not be respected by the public. Sure. Discipline starts with us. And uh, in the next coming few months, we want to ensure that this system works seamlessly. And we want it to work seamlessly with your consent, not with any propulsion on account of consequences. That is the only way in which changes can be received for a lasting goal. So help us, please. We need to weed out quirks. We need to weed out unqualified persons. It starts with you. And there is no handicap because uh, back fees have been waived. Webinars are now online. You can gain knowledge. You can get the points from the comfort of your office or from the comfort of your home. But if you are in bed, please don't go horizontal. <laughs> you need to be upright as you attend these webinars so that the information gets into your mind and uh, it's preserved. That is the way forward. Okay. So related to this, what is the Law Society doing to stimmy corruption in the courts, particularly at the registries? Um, bench fixing, files go missing, date fixing that's appropriate for one party but not the other. Um, please can you tell us what you're doing, especially with the launch of the e-filing system? Yes, with the launch of the e-filing uh, system today, the Chief Justice gave us his undertaking. And there's a man who's undertaking to protect the World Bank, not just uh, a local bank. But the cases of files disappearing, the cases of files missing will no longer be there. And I want to agree with the Chief Justice because I've interrogated that system. It's it's waterproof. It may have some teething problems, but we are going into an age where we will have to discard paper and embrace technology. Bench fixing and corruption in the judiciary, we will work together with our two representatives of the Judicial Service Commission to ensure that individuals recruited as judges and magistrates meet the threshold uh, of, a, of a judicial officer who is capable competent and suffers no bias or influence in making decisions. And I want you to be vigilant. We need to call out judicial officers who are either corrupt or corrupt. And when uh, sometimes I come out and say this, I'm ridiculed by those with the lesser knowledge on matters that we're talking about. I, I've been on record as having uh, made uh, a complaint that resulted in the removal of a judge from office for corruption and being corrupt. We are judges and magistrates who are corrupt. That's the fact. And they are not corrupt because of their own making. They are corrupt because some of our team aid is corrupt. It starts with that. And if you have a good case, you will win. And if you find for a fact that you've lost, not because you didn't have a case, 
but uh, because uh, a judge or a magistrate was seen somewhere cutting deals, then tell us, we'll follow. But let's not vilify judges and magistrates without evidence. In the event that you have to confront a judicial officer, come with good evidence. But uh, most important is for us to remember that you are first an advocate, and second a magistrate, and third a judge. They are part of us. We'll defend their independence, but we'll hold them accountable. Because this is a seesaw. The wheels of justice must move seamlessly. Now, I received a question about the collaborative work that um, your administration is doing. Um, what collaboration or what, what type of work do you do with CLE, the Council for Legal Education, and um, Kenya School of Law in terms of curriculum development, preparing advocates for the reality of practice once they leave Kenya School of Law? And then outside of that, what work and collaborations does LSK have with regional bar associations and international bar associations in order for us to share as well as learn best practices in other jurisdictions? I think it's a part of public knowledge that the failure rate from my kingdom is alarming. Where do we apportion blame? Do we apportion blame on the teachers? I think blame should be apportioned on both. We are ridiculed every day, but when you go to a hotel, when you go to a supermarket, when you go to a social gathering, all those people will tell you, I want my daughter to study law, I want my son to study law. These lawyers are such a bad people. Why are you insisting that you want your children to study law? Because you force your children to go and study law, yet their minds and propulsion is not in practice anymore. Let the child determine what he or she wants to be. Because the practice of law is a calling. You must have the passion to practice law. When some of us joined the university, we joined the university with very high grades. And we used to read. We used to have a, a basin of cold water and put our feet to read. Nowadays, these fellows just want to Google and get answers. Remember, before material ended up in Google, it was researched from the primary document. And the best evidence is the primary evidence. So there is a failure on the part of the students. And this, I must say, without any of Because when I was campaigning, I was sugar coaching. But now I'm, 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 I'm now serving. You must be determined to be a good lawyer. Because if you're not determined to be a good lawyer, You'll be an embarrassment. And you've seen many of these embarrassments coming on national TV, holding themselves as, uh, as lawyers. Yet they have no basic knowledge of uh, what is required. Let me also apportion blame on the teachers uh, in two aspects. I think most of them are determined to earn a living that they don't have sufficient time to dedicate towards the study of law. When we were in Parklands, very few of our lecturers were practitioners. And even those who are practitioners, they got sufficient time to dedicate towards the teaching of law. Right now you'll find a law professor teaching in four universities. Is it humanly possible? It is not. And we need to face these realities. And uh, the second blame also goes to the administration of this university. You remunerate these lecturers well so that they can dedicate their time in the training of law. What about uh, finance? We have seen uh, uh, several officers from a Kenya School of Law who have been arraigned in court. Then there is a problem because we spend a lot of money at Kenya School of Law. Is it worthy? We now begin to see where the money is going. And uh, as the president of the Law Society, we have asked for a report from our representative at the Council of Legal Education of Kenya School of Law as to what really is happening. Are they taking care? of the interests of the students? Are they cognizant of the quality of lawyers that must come out of that institution and join us? Because if they are not, there is a failing that we need to address. But this is an issue that we may implement for a period of time. I will not say that we'll have deliverables within days or months, 
but we are determined to ensure that we have quality advocates getting into the legal uh, market. Hopefully things will improve with uh, CLE and KSL. Yes. Um, okay. um, you mentioned the Inter International Bar Association and how members of the Law Society can attend their symposiums and functions and conferences. Um, a lot of members have complained that the price of CPDs themselves are prohibitive, let alone international conferences. Um, what are you doing to um, make CPDs more accessible to people? I know you've tried to make them virtual during the time of COVID and even reduce the price, uh, but there's been requests from members for free CPDs, at least one or two. Um, what are your views on that? <laughs> And it might also be helpful for members to know that um, council members do not get paid. You do not receive salaries as far as I'm, I'm told. Is that correct? Yes, we, okay. we are not paid as council members, but we get uh, sitting allowance okay. of 10,000 things that is in the public uh, domain. And okay. meetings as far as the uh, LFA are, okay. uh, one a month, okay. every month, um, mm -hmm. from the second Monday, Madam Kamina, you will allow me to speak a little bit on the CPD? Sure. 
Yeah, there's been this false construct that uh, the society earns a lot of money from uh, CPD. We have reviewed the books. For the period uh, January and February, uh, the society spent a total of 33 million on CPD. The income from CPD was 30 million. Where did the rest of the 3 million come from? Between the uh, 11th of May and now, we've held several CPDs through webinars. I, I, I do not think we've earned a lot of money, but I can tell you without any fear of contradiction that we have not spent any of the society's money. And uh, I, I, I saw a request uh, or a question today on Twitter by my very good friend, Jacqueline Manani. Let me remind Jacqueline Manani and many other naysayers, uh, Harvey and his team are not going to make an income out of the law society. In fact, where we can, we'll spend our own monies to ensure that the society thrives. Because it is a good leader, he who dips in his pockets to ensure to the prosperity of the people that he's serving. And let me also tell them, the event you see here being organized has been organized from the pocket of the VP and myself, not monies of the society. We have uh, in a fixed deposit about 70 million monies that are due to the members because these are the collections that were received on account of the arbitration center. I was shocked to realize that before me, these monies had been kept here and not released to members. When we meet on the 23rd of uh, July, I will ask that you give me the permission to return this money where it came from. We don't want to hold people's money in the false notion that we have money. If we don't have money, as we don't have, we don't have money. It's as simple as that. I thought we had money here, which will enable us break ground for LSK Plaza. Friends, there is a problem. We got no money. The only money we have is to sustain us for the short period of time, maybe six months or, uh, or eight months. We must therefore innovate and look for ways. And when you are outside there, don't just critique without the basis of facts. Come and look at the books. You'll see for yourself. We need money, but we're not going to levy members uh, to, to, to develop Gitanga. We want members to make an objective consideration as to whether or not we should sell uh, South Sea and invest the money in this property. We need members to volunteer so that when LSK Plaza is eventually up, you will take pride in saying that I willingly contributed towards this project. There will be no compulsion. Nothing will be tied to your PC application. But I tell you, there are many members who have indicated their willingness to support this noble project. Be part of that project. Don't be left behind. Um, I would like you to discuss more about um, the LSK Plaza that you've just mentioned and the LSK building behind us here, just Gitanga Road. But before we get to that, I just want to ask a question about your Twitter account and politics, and then we'll get back to that question. Okay. Um, uh, a member of the Law Society has requested that you please keep off of politics. Um, and he makes specific reference to a recent ruling by a magistrate, Elizabeth Juma, in which she sentenced Sirisa MP John Waluke and Grace Wahungu um, to hefty fines and um, in the alternate jail sentences. Um, immediately afterwards, you took to social media and you described the sentence as criminal. Um, and you said that you do not celebrate fraudulent convictions and um, you would deal with the judicial officer with military precision. Is this uh, an opinion of the Law Society, your personal opinion, and what exactly did you mean? So the, the war of corruption must be fought. And uh, friends, I ask you to be in the front line in the war against corruption. But the war against corruption should never be weaponized. Because if it is weaponized, it will hurt you, it will hurt me, it will hurt her. In the early 80s, there was a gentleman by the name Master Sergeant Samuel Doe. One day he stormed out of the barracks 
went and killed then President, President Tolbert and, arrayed, and, uh, and, and gave his ministers a four trial, after which they were taken to the, to the shores of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of uh, Monrovia and shot. Why? Because he said they were corrupt. Did Liberia improve? Look, in this particular case, many of those castigating me do not have the benefits of facts. An arbitral award was made in favor of errant supplies. That arbitral award was confirmed as a decree of the High Court. National Cereals and Produce Board sought to set aside that decree and award. They lost. They went to the Court of Appeal and lost. Ganeshi proceedings were commenced. The monies were paid from KCB account to errant supplies on the propulsion of a court order. Look, it turns logic over its head for you to say that a judgment has not been set aside, an award has not been set aside, but you criminalize the recipient of that money. And this is not politics. This law, one of them, and I say so with a lot of authority. Was it two days ago that uh, a senior state council by the name Alexander Muteti was on citizen, mm -hmm. justifying their position? Mm -hmm. Why does the state want to justify the position on media and restrict lawyers from commenting about it. Not so far away, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission told us they are in partnership with the judiciary. A few days thereafter, they told us they are in partnership with the media. Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, DPP, in partnership with the judiciary, in partnership with the media, they are shrinking the media space so that you don't speak. opinion will come out as DOS. So it's upon you to check in what capacity am I speaking. Am I speaking as the president of the Law Society of Kenya or am I speaking as the lawyer for Major uh, Waluke in court? It's not my business to tell you now. I'm now speaking as the president of the Law Society of Kenya. I'm now speaking as defense counsel. No, you should be able to differentiate the two because you elected me in office knowing that I'm a courtroom lawyer. I'm an accomplished courtroom lawyer. I will not stop being a courtroom lawyer because you've elected me president. Where will I get? Where will I get? Okay, thank you. And DOS is Duke of Cloister. Yes, Duke of Cloister. Okay, okay. Good. It's an acronym you that were given to me. <laughs> Good to know. Um, so, in the law society deciding to enjoin itself formally in litigation matters, how are these decisions made that the Law Society is going to be an amicus curiae or uh, an actor in a particular public interest litigation? How are those decisions made? Or is it just on a, on a rolling need-by-need need basis? Madam Vipi, you can take that. Um, sometimes uh, we are seen as the interested party. Okay. So sometimes and, uh, when we are seen like uh, we are seen in the
feel as a society we need to perform some of our functions under uh, section 4 of the act to guide the court and uh, also the public on uh, uh, matters uh, at, uh, on, on, on the position, the true position of the law at the present stage so that the court is not described. We, when we identify such matters, then uh, we discuss with the council that we appoint an advocate. Uh, above all, uh, and in line with the, the president's uh, number one agenda, is uh, that we should not be acting as interested parties. We move the court whenever we see uh, abuses of the law by the state or any other uh, violators of the constitution. So we initiate uh, the proceedings. I think after we took office, we will clean many of the cases that. Uh, we have filed in court, we have filed as a petitioner of the parties. So we do not just necessarily have to wait to be enjoined or to, uh, to enjoin a matter. We uh, currently monitor legislation. Uh, the president is passionate about that. Uh, we have uh, a legislation department here. We also have a committee um, that monitors what is happening. If we feel that uh, uh, something is wrong, we go to court and move swiftly. So we've done uh, a series of this. The, the example is the COVID-19 rule, the curfew, so we can have the court cards. So we, we listen to news, we pick the politics, we pick from tweets, we pick from legislation, we pick from social media, and uh, uh, go to court to be in line with the, uh, our functions and objects. Uh, and the so thank you so much. You no, know, my Ebo Vice President has adequately addressed that question. So, um, as I wind down with my questions before we pass it on to the floor, um, one of the hallmarks of your leadership has been that it's a majority women, uh, not only in the membership of the Law Society, but in the Council itself. Um, traditionally, it was a profession dominated by men. I think in the UK, they used to call it a gentleman society. Now it became a law society, before that it was the legal fraternity. Some people are saying it should now be called the uh, a sorority. Um, what, what is the society doing regarding the two-thirds gender rule in, at government level? Good. Yesterday, Madam Vicky and I met a very senior member of the bar. She was the chair of FIDA in the 80s, and she told us, how vocal they were. And uh, she really intrigued me. She said, Sasa mimi nataka kuhudi kwa LSK kwa Fujo because naona LSK imekuwa fili likuwa wakati wetu. Leaders to be. And uh, I'm, I'm a very proud man because uh, I have uh, 10 women in my council. I think I'm more advantaged than was uh, Moses before me. I think if he had 10 women leading him uh, on the way to Canaan, they would have arrived in two weeks. No wonder, therefore, you see, we're able to make tremendous progress. Yeah. So there is no handicap. But at the national level, there is a big problem. Decisions have been made by courts that the two-third gender rule must be honored. And if it's not honored, then parliament must be dissolved. Petitions are lying before Chief Justice David Maraga and I don't know why it's procrastinating on this issue. Uh, a few days ago, I met the women of Kenya here, and they told me we need now to be proactive, because I can say without any fear of contradiction, FIDA is not doing its work as it's used to do when uh, uh, Justice uh, uh, Dr. Nancy Baraza was chair and Martha Karua was vice chair. They were more vocal than even the position then. But we are not accustomed to lame lamentations. We will not say we can't do anything because FIDA has said it will not do anything. We will do something for the women of Kenya because the women of Kenya are our grandmothers. They are our mothers. They are our wives. They are our sisters. And for those who are not married, they are your girlfriends. We must assist them. We must ensure that the Constitution is complied with insofar as the two-third gender role is concerned. And through the Gender Committee of the Law Society, we're going to pursue this issue to its conclusion. Uh, these people say that we are very antagonistic. 
We cannot be antagonistic when we are asking you to do that which is lawful and just. And if you perceive it to be antagonistic, then you better find a firm ground because we'll push you. And may I tell the President of the Republic of Kenya and the Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya that we want the two-third gender rule to be fully actualized. If we don't have two-thirds of women in the National Assembly, in the Senate, in the county assemblies, and in, our, in, in the bodies that appoint officers, then we've got a, a big problem with you. We will ask that Parliament be dissolved. Not next year, now. So one more question before I stop. Um, as we've heard, your track record is full of so many accomplishments. It's only a hundred days and drastic changes have happened, um, especially as compared to previous um, LSK administrations. Um, your tenure is only for two years and they've been calls from members. You, you, you won by a landslide victory. They've been calls from members to amend the constitution so that you can stay in power longer. What are, you, what are your views on that? And just generally your views in terms of amending a constitution for the convenience of a certain leadership or power or dynasty to stay, to stay in power, please. I, I don't know where my mother got the name Nelson. I don't think it was Nelson uh, of Trafalgar, but I think it must have been from Nelson Mandela. Oh, okay. I, I do not have an intention whatsoever of, uh, of staying my welcome longer than necessary. This work is burdensome, my friend. My hair has grown white <laughs> within two months. <laughs> Not because I'm old, I'm very young, but because of the pressure of work. In fact, if I was to write my memoirs for the time that I'll be in office, I think they will be appropriately titled The, the, the Burden of Office. Look, a, a good leader is one who, shall, who serves within a short period of time. Otherwise, if I was to serve you for four years, you'll be able to see many of my bad traits. I want you to see my good traits, and those should be the traits that will improve the society. But before I leave uh, the helm of leadership of the Law Society, I want LSK Plaza. To occupy this I don't want us to spend money in hotels for conferences and seminars. I want us to have an auditorium here where we can sit a maximum of 400 people. I want by the time we go for the next election that relates to the Law Society of Kenya, and I think this is for the women representative of the Judicial Service Commission, we have elaborate electronic system of voting. We don't want to delegate this role to other entities. I want uh, Muzala I want uh, Aska, I want Doreen, I want uh, Jamul, everybody here to be able to run for president of the Law Society without going to counties uh, uh, to ask governors to finance you with the project. It is very costly to run for this office. I want members of the Law Society to realize that you don't need money to, to run for office. You just need to distinguish yourself in your service to the Kenyan public to the lawyers, because that is the hallmark of leadership. That is the legacy I want to leave behind, because it has been very difficult for me to run for office. Deep state, government, putting all roadblocks, tax compliance certificate, threatening you with prosecution, threatening you that they will release videos. You saw the other day they released videos of Maraga. 
you 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 will think that they have content. This is bullshit. Mm? We need to be able to lead the society, to serve the society, without looking back as to what they're gonna do to you. Because it is not an office where you are remunerated. You need to say go you practice for two years. So that when we sit here and make these decisions, those who want to have a, a divergent view must realize we're not making money out of this fight. We volunteer to serve. And they want many to volunteer to serve uh, as and when we leave office and for the entire duration of uh, your life as advocates. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from Munzala regarding um, LSK Plaza, your dreams um, and the current premises. But before we get into that question, we're just going to screen a video of the current premises. And then from there, we'll take Munzala's question and comments. Friends, at the AGM we have requested that uh, the membership approves a notice of motion in which we want to develop Gitanga Road. This building has been condemned by the Nairobi County Government. The more reason as to why the need for us to develop uh, it into an ultra-modern plaza is uh, needed now more than ever. You can see the congested atmosphere in which uh, our very good receptionist uh, works here. However, you admit there is uh, a need for us to transform into an ultra-modern facility. Yes. The, 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 the plague that we have set here for our past chair and uh, past presidents is already full. And you can see it's also congested. Uh, the, the need to expand uh, is quite evident. Let me take you upstairs. We see how our secretariat uh, is doing and uh, the need for us to expand and have more space. This ideally is the congested uh, room. How are you? Kosalama. Yes, it is a congested room where the support staff for the secretariat works. Uh, Ideally, an organization of this magnitude requires uh, at least 1,000 uh, and a maximum of 2,000 square feet for the secretariat uh, to work optimally. Let's look at uh, our boardroom uh, facility so that uh, we realize the, the need for us to improve. How are you? Enjoying your lunch? Good. This. Uh, Small uh, room, not even uh, 100 uh, square feet is, is, is our boardroom. Often we have many meetings that have to be held by the council, committees, and such a meetings have to be held elsewhere in hotels. We incur a lot of expenses because we cannot hold a meeting here. And the situation is even dire with the digital uh, uh, edge will need a facility that uh, can effectively accommodate uh, the, the, the people in that meeting and if it is being transmitted the people at the other end and uh, of course behind us is Gitanga Road you realize you cannot have any meaningful uh, business here with the noise good uh, sorry Uh, these are our washroom facilities. This building has been here for over 40 years. It is no longer conducive for use in uh, these uh, uh, in, uh, times. Let's uh, see what we have down there. 
And uh, remember, the Secretariat uh, hosts about uh, 40 staff. This building alone is less than uh, 3,000 square feet. This is a waiting room. We, we, we need uh, a modern uh, waiting room, a lobby, where our members can be served, where the members of the public can be adequately taken care of, and where good business can be undertaken, even as they wait for, for, for somebody to, to serve them. There have had to be some uh, improvements on account of a container that has been fabricated. Uh, a lot of business is done here. Uh, come, come, we have a look. This, friends, is where we store our files. It, it is a shame. A premium bar association should not be having such a mega facilities to store its files. Uh, even the washroom facilities, they are very limited, bearing in mind uh, the human traffic here, both on account of staff and the members that are being served. The more reason, therefore, why we need to take a firm position on the 23rd uh, of July. We, make to, we need to decide between this property and Mombasa Road, which one do we keep? But from uh, the viable uh, studies that have been conducted, together with the recommendations, it looks more prudent to develop uh, Kitanga Road as opposed to Mombasa Road. Let's see uh, the outer side of the container. Another container here where many of our staff are housed. Now, if you look behind us, this is uh, the available space that has not been developed here in Gitanga Road. The entire property is slightly over one acre. In this uh, zone, we have the potential of developing an ultra-modern plaza that can go as high as uh, six floor and uh, as low as uh, three parking bays. That is sufficient to take care of uh, our office, to make provision for small offices for the branches, to have uh, a conference facility, to have a library, to have uh, a clubhouse, and all the necessary facilities that uh, advocates may require to enable their business uh, run smoothly, and also for recreation. We don't need to go to, uh, is it 1824? <laughs> yeah, you don't need to go to 1824. You can have your facility here. You don't need to go to Serena for, for exercise. You can do it here. You understand? And that is what I've uh, thought is important to let you know. So that as we mark our 100 year, uh, days in office, we can objectively evaluate where have we come from, where are we and where should we be? So far, we have uh, attained several milestones within the, the, the first 100 days. But I believe the best legacy that we leave for the society and those who will come after us is to develop this place in the manner in which I've requested. So come the 23rd of July, please make an informed consideration. Uh, the sale of uh, the South Sea property may be sufficient to give us the structure, the frame. But uh, the finer details of the building will require input from the members. A member may volunteer to buy a seat, may volunteer to buy a window, may volunteer to furnish a, a, a meeting room, a library. And uh, many of our senior colleagues have said they are ready, willing and able to do that. I've gotten uh, the assurance from uh, Honorable Paul Mwite that will be prepared to put in something. I've got an assurance from uh, Senior Counsel uh, 
I mean, Nasir Abdullahi say he'll be prepared to put something. Uh, senior counsel uh, Tom Ogenda is ready, willing, and able to put something. And even on my part, I want to have the Nelson Harvey uh, auditorium or the Nelson Harvey uh, wing of the library. We stock the library. Sawa. So to find you. I'm an Very important. Yeah. Good. Thank you. That was a video of our current premises here at Kitanga Road. And our colleague, Mr. Munzala, would like to say some comments and questions about the current situation. Munzala, please. Good evening, everyone. Munzala. So, at the mention that uh, you quite intend to move the membership, to give you the permission to develop this property, I was quite happy. So, um, contrary to what was done before, contrary to the, to the, to the process that were taken before, um, I'm hoping and assuming that we'll take quite a bit of time to speak to the membership, to now uh, allow you to engage to this uh, uh, enterprise. So, I don't know what plans you have to reach out to the membership and your expectation of the membership or your expectation to the partners that you want to bring on board to ensure that you actualize whatever it is that you want to actualize as far as you're in this property. Okay. Now, uh, this this area, the, the zone does not permit any building past uh, six blocks. So we must confine ourselves to that zone. The, the, the cost of, be, uh, of building the frame alone of the building will be about 250 million. The time frame, you're looking at uh, between six to eight months putting up such a structure. The property we have in South Sea has been with us for more than 30 years. The council has uh, drafted a motion requesting members to approve the sale of that property so that uh, we raise the monies to enable us come with come up with the frame of the building. But as I've indicated, uh, when I took you through the building, uh, we may need to finalize the details of the building to our perfection. We'll therefore require more money. I do not want to levy members to contribute to what this cause. I want members to contribute from their own. And I can tell you, there are very many members, especially senior members of the bar, who have pledged their support. Others have gone as far as pledging close to five million. And it doesn't matter how much you are able to pledge or bring in. Whatever amount, just bring it. Coril uh, tackled me on Twitter and said, if his picture is not in this album, then the album is null and void a uh, Donald, I can see your picture here. Uh, you are here. At another point, you are speaking to the former Chief Justice, uh, 
Dr. William Mutunga, and here you are speaking to the president. So Donald, because of your seniority in the society, I think we'll find you, we'll give you this album. It takes uh, 40,000 to produce the two volumes, but I purpose to sell the album at uh, a, a maximum of 100, and for 100, I'm targeting the senior lawyers. Anybody above uh, five years in practice, if you come and find your, your photograph here, take the album for 100,000 shillings. Uh, 40 will go towards the production, and uh, 60 will go towards the development. If you are below 10 years and you find your photograph here, and you are desirous of buying this, you can buy it uh, for between uh, 60 and 80, the two volumes, depending on your years of practice so that we're able to raise funds. But uh, forward, we'll want to encourage members just to, you can even buy a bag of cement. You can buy a, a window frame. You can buy a seat. You can buy an entire conference uh, hall or meeting room. You can, uh, you can buy the library. You can furnish uh, the, the clubhouse. You can furnish the gym. You can furnish the auditorium. And, and of course, we will be very happy to have uh, the Javier Munzala meeting room or the Javier Munzala reception desk. Yeah. These are ways in which we can raise funds to, to, to bring up this noble project. I think it's doable. For those who have uh, built their houses, it, it, it's something that we can do very easily if we team up together and realize that we are premium bar. Other bars in Africa have done much more. The Teacher Service Commission have a building in the Central Business District. Really? Lawyers? There is a problem. My mother is a teacher. My father was a teacher. The fellows own a building in the Central Business District. Let's do something for ourselves. Our final speaker, Jamu, says his comments or his questions, and then, and then we'll wind up the day. Good evening to you all. Good evening. Uh, my name is Doreen Kubai, and uh, mine is not a question, it's rather a comment. I'd like to say congratulations, Mr. President, Vice President, and all the council members for these 100 days of bravery and vibrancy. I think this, is what, this was missed, especially in our previous... Um, leadership and uh, we will be supporting you throughout and uh, I believe I speak for many that uh, we made a good choice in February so do not let us down I believe you will not let us down so keep up the good work thank you thank you Mr. Harvey was on your third pillar, defending rule of law and constitutionalism. Um, you have told us that uh, we have received emails from the law set of Kenya asking us to, to give them orders that have not been obeyed by the court. Now, my question is this. Once the law society receives them, what are they going to do with them? That is my question. We have received about 200 orders against the government. the government to do something. We'll also ask the Attorney General as the legal advisor of the Republic of, of Kenya and who has uh, the final responsibility as to whether or not a court order has been
So these fellows who want to expel me without a fair hearing, we are a civilized society. So we'll give him a fair hearing, both on the money decrease and the other compulsive decrease. We'll give him, a, as usual, 14 days to tell us if there is any handicap. If there is an appeal pending against the court order, then we'll abide by the outcome of the appeal. But if there is no appeal, or if an appeal has been lodged and lost, then the, the state must pay with him. The state must comply with the compulsive orders. And if they don't, then we'll take it further. You remember on the 18th of March 2018, Justice Odunga gave an order relating to C.S. Matiangi, uh, Dr. Uh, Kihalangwa, and I think then the Inspector General of Police, indicating that they were unsuitable to continue holding public office for the reason that they disobeyed a court order. To go for elective office, some of them even for the president of the Republic of Kenya. We're going. We're not going to allow you to run for public office if you have abused your public office as a, a state officer. So we'll go a step further. We'll file a petition in court, enumerating the individuals behind those offices. Your office will not protect you. If you are Dr. Fred Matiangi and you've disobeyed a court order, we're coming for you. Personally, if you are Kamiki Kihara and you disobeyed a court order, we are coming for you personally, so that we have a declaration that you are unsuitable to hold public office. So that next year, when you want to be Chief Justice and you've disobeyed a court order, we'll say no, the matter is in court. Order determination has been made. You're not suitable to become Chief Justice. You're not suitable to run for office as President of the Republic of Kenya. You're not suitable to run for office as Governor. You're not suitable to run for office as member of the county assembly. Because if we don't do this, we'll have crooks running for office. And we have so many crooks in public office. Let us have leaders of integrity. People like Barack Obama. You understand? Let us have leaders that are accountable. Not individuals who get pride in their transgressions as a justification to say, okay, fine, I've been acquitted of this, I've done this, so I'm going home for a homecoming. And when I reach home, I declare my interest to run for public office. The culture of Kenyans electing individuals who do not obey the law, individuals who do not have ideals for a good society, must come to an end. Thank you very much. Um, any final words, Madam VP, please, to the society? had a forum where we can thank members for the support that they accorded us uh, and put us in office with uh, full trust and faith that uh, we will serve them. Mine is to give them a commitment that uh, together with the president and the council uh, we will uh, serve them uh, passionately and diligently as promised in our manifestos. Of course I will still run with my mantra welfare first. I will uh, do anything within my reach uh, to serve members. Uh, every time they reach me, I am reachable and uh, I will not stop uh, picking calls even after we have given uh, a hotline. Uh, I encourage, encourage members to reach out to me and to reach out to us as a council if they have uh, any issues that they need to, rise, uh, to raise with us. Uh, we take the criticism, both negative and uh, positive, uh, and uh, we will always put uh, the criticism of whatever nature the, uh, into consideration. Uh, we are not in competition. We are serving members. We will carry on uh, with the service to members for the next two years. Uh, I give my undertaking that uh, whatever I have to do, uh, together with uh, my president and the council members, I will do to ensure that uh, we uh, take this society to uh, an, a level above where we found it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Harvey, in conclusion, any parting shots or calls to members? Friends, I'll 
the 27th of February 2020, gave me an overwhelming mandate to serve you. He gave me 2,675 votes. Imagine between myself and the person who came next was 1,600. I didn't know that you will elect me. I didn't know that you will not elect me. But I knew in the event that you were to elect me or not elect me, the margin between myself and the person next will have been 200,000. But you, you, you did the most unexpected thing. You made a decision that was definitive. You were firm in your choice. Do not expect me to be malleable. Do not expect me to keep quiet. Do not expect me to be indolent. Because I speak on your behalf. You told me to go and do things. You told me to go and speak on your behalf. I'm doing these things. And if I was not doing the things that you asked me to do, then the retaliation that we are facing from big sets and from those who do not I promise you that with your support, you will be able to achieve all the things and we may do more. We leave the society better than we found it. But most importantly, may I thank you, young, middle and senior advocates, for restoring the lost glory of the society. The glory of the society does not benefit me a lot. When I punch and get it, you've gotten it. I'll ensure that what you've given me to do will be done. And whoever takes over from me will have a very conducive atmosphere of serving as the president of the Law Society of Kenya. Mungu wa mbariki na sana. On that note, thank you very much.